Welcome, <clears throat> everyone. Happy Goat's Milk Appreciation Week. Here we all are. Here we all are. So um, while you're all joining into the webinar, into the Zoom tonight, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Academy of Cheese in case you don't know. I'm Tracy Colley, one of the founding directors of the Academy and operations uh, director currently working our little socks off to create a tiered education system for people working in cheese and people who just love cheese. So um, we've been very busy with the webinars this week. We've been doing webinars around Affinure of the Year, which is our fantastic competition around affinage. And one of our panellists tonight is a goat's milk farmer and goat's milk cheese maker, Roger Longman. So welcome, Roger. He joined me last night as well in the webinar for Affinure of the Year. His cheese is being affinured by um, a number of contestants around the country and will come to our finals on April the 12th. So um, what I'm going to say about tonight is we are going to talk to all these lovely goat's milk people here. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions of them, please do use the chat or the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screens, hopefully at the bottom of your screen, maybe on some people's it's at the side. Um, and do add those questions and I'll ask them to the panelists at the appropriate moments. If you'd like to put in the chat where you're joining us from, that'd be wonderful. I'm in Norfolk. Um, I know Roger's in Somerset and I'm sure we'll talk to everybody else where they are. Um, we had some people from around the world last night join us, so do tell us. Oh, up in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, miserable. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know, I've just got the sun out first time today, look. Joining from Ohio in the United States, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Hampton Court, another from Scotland, wonderful. Canada, Sweden, Derbyshire, amazing. Welcome. We are all thoroughly international tonight. So that's wonderful. Devon, Nottingham, love it. United States, Wiltshire. I think I missed you. Amazing. Well, welcome, welcome. Right. Let's get going. And um, I'm going to uh, bring onto screen and spotlight now um, Gary, who is with us and going to introduce himself. Um, and tell us all about your son, Gary, please. I'm just trying to add my spotlight. That's great. Uh, good evening, Welcome, everybody. Gary. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Gary Yeomans. So I'm a dairy goat farmer from near Abergavenny in lovely Monmouthshire in South Wales, South East Wales. So I've been milking goats for, for 22 years. So uh, I've got the goat cam behind me. You can see some of the goats. I would have done it live in the shed, but they'd have been chewing my ear and pulling my shirt and whatnot. So you've just got them on the screen for now. So I'm really grateful to Tracy and the Academy of Cheese for allowing us to use this opportunity to showcase all the fantastic British goat's cheeses that we all produce collectively. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about everybody else's cheese and telling you about the cheese made with our goat's milk. So how many goats has it you've got? 200? Uh, no, there's, uh, we milk about 500, yeah. 500, wow, fantastic. I love, love, love the goat cam. And so does your milk go into a cooperative for um, to, to lots of different cheese makers or to a specific cheese maker? No, I'm really lucky that I've got a... a cheese maker just in Abergavenny only five miles away so Abergavenny Fine Foods so they take all my milk and make it into soft goat's cheese which I'll talk about a bit later on. Fantastic absolutely wonderful so um, Gary would you like me to go to Rachel next who's going to talk us all through about her um, goat's cheese is that right? Yeah that'd um, be brilliant. Okay I'm going to de-spotlight you with no offence at all and <laughs> Come back to Rachel. Hello, Rachel. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Good evening. Wonderful, Hi. wonderful goat cheese. I was just saying we were nibbling away on your Cynodon Hill at our, on our level three tasting course because it is a level three cheese. 
just absolutely one of the ones we study absolutely wonderful so um oh, tell us all about your your farm and your cheese making and your life in goat's um, milk are we so am i just doing a quick introduction now or are we doing the whole yes shebang? no yeah introduction and tell us all about it um yeah so um yeah mine is rachel and with my husband fraser um we've got a herd of about 200 goats um, we're based in Oxfordshire um, and we decided to become cheese makers and goat farmers about 10 years ago. In fact, it was 10 years ago this year um, and that was a career change for us. Before that, I was a teacher and Fraser was a project manager. Um, but yeah, we got, a, um, got the idea that we wanted to change careers and give this a go. Um, so it was a massive learning curve, but um, <laughs> it's been, um, yeah, good fun along the way. And uh, yeah, and so we've built up the herd. We've started with two goats. Now we've got, um, yeah, somewhere north of 200. And uh, we started off making Cynodon and then we started making Brightwell Ash as well in um, 2019. Um, so that's yeah. That's a massive leap from two to 200. Has that been gradual over the, over the 10 years? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's difficult to find um, one of my bugbears with the archers is always that when people decide they want to do something like get a new breed or get a certain type of animal, they a week later they've got them. But in real farming life, it's not like that at all, especially not in goats. <laughs> and, um, we had a particular um, breed we had in mind that we wanted. And um, yeah, so you have to buy, you have to buy, you know, no one sells their best goats usually. So it's a slow process of trying to build up and buy, we bought them bought them young bought a couple that were in kid and then yeah I think the um second year we had 35 third year we had sort of 90 and then yeah we've been sort of um a bit more steady since I don't know now four or five years something like that fantastic yeah. and what do you have a particular breed of goat that you're um that you have um, well, we started off with um, Anglo-Nubians, which are known as the Jersey cow of the goat world. Um, but as time's gone on, we've been um, crossing them more. So sort of to get a goat more, um, it's more adapted to the kind of farming system we want to run and um, to the British climate, to um, eating hay and grass and for making cheese. So now we've got some crosses with Anglo-Nubian and British Toggenberg, some with um, French Alpine, some with um, British Sarnen. Um, so yeah, and uh, I've got my eyes on a few other breeds to try crossing with as well. Um, yeah, that's the fun part. Do you, en you enjoy that? You obviously enjoy that side of the business then. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We both, Fraser and I both do all, both do goat stuff and cheese stuff but as time's gone on I think um the goats is kind of um a bit more my domain and Fraser's probably our sort of head cheese maker but um uh I still do make cheese um but my favorite bit is probably the goats yeah brilliant and eating how lovely. <laughs> how lovely and um did you have some pictures that you wanted Toby to share tonight oh uh, you... yeah yeah, I've got a, um, yeah, Toby, are you able to share that? I've got some photos of our farm and our cheese making. Brilliant. Yeah, I will do. Then, are we, is Rachel then going to go into the tasting of Cynodon Hill? I think, up to you guys, yeah. I think that would be really yeah. nice, because I'm sure all of our audience are sitting here with their wonderful boxes. Um, uh, they were lucky enough yeah, to there have, some a, who a, have a, yeah, there some who a box of boxes. cheese, so it would be great to start nibbling, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, Rachel, I'll bring your presentation up. I'll share the screen. Thanks. So this was slightly modified from a presentation I did to a local WI group. So <laughs> hopefully it'll still all make sense. Um, but um, yeah, there's just some pictures to give some content. So you can see a bit of our farm and um, our goats and our where we make the cheese and sort of the processes behind it. Um, so you can picture it a bit more. We've um, just got your files at the moment, Um uh, I've got it on screen. I'm share screen. Uh, right. I've, I've, is it worked? No, we're actually on your um on your That's list. That's really unhelpful. Right. In Stop that share. Folder. So okay. you need to share. Click on the thing. Click click on the actual presentation. I was also okay, going to say. I will do that. Um, is that working? Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. 
Yep. Uh, okay. Cool. A bit more of our um farm. Then uh, we had a feature on Country File last Sunday. Um. So yeah, there's a bit more sort of um footage from around our farm if you want to look that up. So yeah, that's um that's Fraser and I, and um, those are the two cheeses that we make. So Cinnadon is the pyramid, and Brightwell Ash is the um, ash covered one. Um. So if you go forward, Toby, to the next slide. Um, and as I was sort of saying before, our, um, so yeah, our decision to become goat farmers came from, um, reading a article about a goat's cheese maker in a woman and home magazine. It's not actually a publication that I usually take, but, um, it had been left in a, a place we stayed in on holiday and, um, I was leaning on it to play a game and then read this article <laughs> and sort of joking about it. And then. I mean, to be honest, I've been teaching for a while and was thinking, <laughs> thinking it might have been time for change anyway. But um, for some reason, this captured our imagination. And um, on the plane journey home, when we were having a gin and tonic, um, I was like, oh, I totally want to go back to being a teacher. So we kind of drew up a business plan there and then. Um, and then uh, people often ask how we learned to be cheesemakers. And uh, a lot of it was sort of Googling. Um, and then that picture there, that horrible looking um, cheese is the first cheese that we ever made at home. Actually, it's the second cheese because the first one we attempted to make at home, our um, kitten ended up um, uh, getting into. And um, we thought <laughs> it, wasn't very, it wasn't very hygienic. Um, but yeah, that, that was as, tasted as horrible as it looks. But um, you have to start somewhere. And then um, there was a lot of trial and error, basically. And um, uh, yeah, about uh, a year after we had the idea, we um, secured a farm tenancy um, and then... Uh, start getting the goats so yeah that, that's us with a couple of our early goats um next slide toby that's no mean feat securing a farm tenancy i would imagine yeah it's pretty challenging and um especially in the part of the world we're in, in oxfordshire um there's a lot of competition for land um so there's a lot of big arable farms in this area and then there's a lot of people rich people with horses and um, a lot of people wanted to build housing and housing developments as well um so yeah it was quite um it was quite tricky but um our landlords are a, an environmental charity that have a um a sort of scheme for getting um startup farm businesses with a sustainable ethos going so um that's how we we had to present and submit a business plan for that so i think that was probably quite a good discipline actually because it meant we had to have our numbers um our numbers down so that's the farm on a fairly gray day um and uh yeah so on the left you've got the um the fields where the goats go out and then you can see our shipping containers we can just about see um so we make our cheese in there's a bit more close up data but we make our cheese in those shipping containers there and that's our milking parlor so the farm we're on um yeah we took over as tenants and it's not what you would um it's not what you build from um scratch if you started now but um yeah had to use a bit of ingenuity and then the goat barn is sort of around the back there um so yeah next slide toby but how wonderful because you've got the milk there and you're yeah. you know you're milking and then taking the milk straight into the yeah. from the milking parlor into the dairy and making cheese yeah it's about four straight four away. meters it needs to travel so yeah no it's not four far meters wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think that's one of the shortest distances i've heard do you pasteurize the milk uh yeah we do mm. yeah we've got a little pasteurizer in um in the dairy yeah um we originally made it with raw milk but um yeah it's um it's a bit of less of a um headache yeah exactly roller coaster ride um pasteurizing um so yeah that's our milking parlor so we've got quite a small we've got 12 points in our milking parlor and um actually i think that picture we've now got 12 sets of clusters in there as well i think we, that was when we used to have just six sets of clusters but 12 stools so we melt milk them 12 at a time um so that's yeah them in the yard and waiting to go into milking so we melt them twice a day um we melt them at 7 30 in the morning and four in the afternoon so we don't do like crazy early um dairy hours um because i don't like getting up really early <laughs> but yeah 7 30 is still quite early for us um but yeah that works quite well for us um yeah if you on to the next slide they look very happy for it <laughs> so that's the um that's the barn that they're in when they're inside um and it's always got embarrassingly massive cobwebs in it so avert your eyes from those but um yeah you can kind of see the 
different a bit of the different types of breeds we've got there um so yeah that's actually not the whole herd there that's about 80 goats there i think and we've also got another barn now that um the other half of the herd are in um so yeah if you keep going toby um so yeah these are some of our goats and like i was saying we've got a bit of a mixture of breeds now so in the one on the left the, the black goat that's nearest to us that's a kind of pure anglo-nubian and they've got these long floppy ears um and a sort of mm. roman nose um and they were originally from a cross between a um a north african goat and a um, sort of native english type goat um so yeah the good thing about those is they have very high milk solids the bad thing is they can be quite sensitive um and they're particularly not very keen on the um on the rain um that we have in this climate so um more recently we've had some different crosses like the kid in the middle is a toggenberg british toggenberg crossed with an anglo nubian and you get some quite hilarious because the toggenbergs have sort of sticky up ears like that but the anglo nubians have the long ones so you end up with some quite um hilarious long but yet sticky out ears um and those have been really great goats actually those crosses we really like those and then we've got some um the one on the right you can see some british sarnan crosses there and again they've got sort of mid-length ears um oh. so yeah we've got quite a variety now and our most recent kids um are the french alpine crosses so we'll see how they do next fantastic and then, so yeah, as I said before, our cheese making is in um, three converted shipping containers. We started with two converted shipping containers, then we added another one. Um, so that's what they look like from the outside. I think it sometimes sounds a bit like we're in sheds or something when you say shipping containers, but inside they're actually very um, high spec, um, hygienic. Uh, they work well. I mean, yeah, we do have to get used to doing things in long, thin spaces because they're I don't know how wide the shipping container it's like eight foot or something um so yeah uh things are quite narrow but um we've got very good at making the most of small spaces so that's uh i think that's frozen that picture i'm just trying to see um stirring of that and milk so we've just started a make in there that's one of our make rooms and then that's some synod and molded on the table in there so yeah anyway that's kind of vaguely what um cheese rooms look like on the inside um do you make cheese every, you know, how many days a week do you make cheese? Um, so we usually start to make four days of the week. Um, and then the cheese processes, well, I'll come to this, but they either take three or four days to make each cheese. So there's cheese making. We milk every day of the year and we make cheese every day of the year. But we start a make on four days and then each cheese, um, the kind of cheese we make um, takes, it has processes that have to happen over um, four days. Well, three days in one, four days in the other, and then um, they need maturing after that. And keep Fantastic. going. So, yeah, day one of the cheese making process. So, the kind of cheese we make is called a lactic cheese, which is a very um, long, slow, gentle acidification. It's kind of a glorified version of just like leaving a bucket of milk, how people would have made farmhouse cheese traditionally, just leaving a bucket of milk in the corner of a room to sour um, and then adding a bit of salt. It's a kind of glorified um, version of that. So, on the first day, um, we pump it in and get it to temperature, which is 22 degrees. Um, then we leave it, add some starter cultures um, and then leave it overnight. So milk will sour with the naturally occurring lactic acid bacteria, but we want it to be a bit more controlled and predictable than what will happen if you just leave it to its own devices. Um, and the pH drops um, from, so it's milk in its normal form is just slightly acidic, just below seven. Um, but once it's acidified, it's down at 4.6. And that acidification makes the um, lacti the lactose, the milk sugar, turn to lactic acid. And then that acidity brings the milk protein, the casein, out of solution. And then the rennet, um, we use a vegetarian rennet called cardoon. It's um, derived from cardoon thistle. Uh, makes the, um, the proteins bond together in a gel. And that's your curd. So that happens overnight. So the first day, we're literally getting the milk in and adding this, the um, starter cultures. Um, then the day two for synodon on the left you can see um that's synodon once we've so we get a, like a two liter jug and we um it turns into curds and whey which is um it looks a bit like sort of what you get in a set yogurt or um if your milk stays in the fridge too long goes bad you know you kind of get this that separation so and we want to drain off the whey so we um ladle the curd into those um they're basically glorified pillowcases um so you ladle I think it's six or eight jugs into each one and then the whey drains out again it sits there overnight so that process takes a couple of hours then it'll be waiting with brightwell we use a different ladling method so 
we use that um, thing that looks like an ice cream scoop to ladle the curd out one scoop at a time um, and each uh, mold gets five scoops in it and then it drains down slowly um, then we turn it once it's drained down a bit drains down more um, and then yeah we leave it overnight for that way to come off and then on the third day which is the next slide um, that looked like my very good friend Owen Davis on that last slide yeah it's not <laughs> that's right <laughs> Doesn't actually you work roped him into I roped him into cheese making for the day, did you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Um, so on the left, you can see what happens overnight. So the top photo on the left is the um, draining bags when they've just been filled with curd, and then the next morning is what you come back to find when all the waste drain off. Um, so then that's what's left in those bags is sort of like the texture of um, cream cheese, sort of like Philadelphia. Um, so then we empty out of those bags. We add salt. There's Fredo adding some salt um, and we mix that in by hand. So that kind of improves the texture and also gets the salt spread throughout the cheese. And then we push them into those pyramid molds. It's a bit like um, making sandcastles. We push them in and get them sort of firm down um, and then they get left overnight. So yeah. that's quite an easy process. Brightwell ash on its third day. Um, so you get these quite, they're quite soft at this point, but they are formed. Um, and we roll them in a mixture of um, salt and um, it's actually vegetable carbon. It's not really ash technically. Fraser always corrects me when I say that. Um, and it's uh, so we get that from France. Um, and you actually don't need very much. It's a very tiny amount gives it, um, gives it that color, the coloration. Um, but it forms a good um, base for the natural rind to grow on top of that. Um, so yeah, then you do that, all that by hand as well. Yeah, that's all by wow. hand. Um, Labor intensive then. Yeah, and then so from day four onward. So on the left, you've got a. Um, so we unmold the cynodon on day four. So again, it's like sand castles, sort of tapping them out of their molds. Um, so at that point, there a pit there. You can see in the sort of the photo with six things on it the first day they're just like a white cheese and then they spend 48 hours in what we call a hastener which is where we've got um it's kind of a warm uh, moist environment for the yeast to develop on the rind um, and that gradually you can kind of see the development there um so it gradually gets more um the yeast developed so you get that wrinkly geotrichum um and then that uh just continues to sort of tighten up and um develop as, as they age and then, yeah, similarly, the Brightwells, um, they develop their rind gradually. We don't hasten Brightwell, actually, that, that's a slower developing rind. Um, so, yeah, we turn them every day. That's me turning Brightwell um, in our, our maturing room. Um, and then, yeah, so that's kind of the, that's basically the maturing process. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of trying to get the, the humidity getting the humidity just right and it varies according to what the weather's doing outside therefore how much your um, fridge units are coming on how much cheese you've got in the room like at Christmas time when you're holding a lot more stock then um, the cheeses all behave differently because there's so much more moisture in the environment so then you have to get the dehumidifiers in so there's a lot of sort of tweaking and every batch is genuinely quite different um yeah you can keep going <laughs> it's all the skills that our 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 affineurs are trialing during our competition <laughs> yeah getting that humidity fun, right and the atmosphere right look at all those awards <laughs> so yeah we've had um a good couple of years for awards recently um we got the last two years we were in the top 16 of the world cheese awards out of sort of 4,000 ish cheeses. That um, is of amazing. All different... That is some kind of accolade because I, <laughs> you know, we, well, I'm lucky enough to judge and it is, that's phenomenal. Very well done. Yeah. It's quite hard to believe, but um, yeah, it was pretty, um, pretty cool. Um, last year's one happened on my birthday, actually. So that was a good, um, that was a good birthday present. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, so we got the the best British cheese at the World Cheese Awards last year and the year before best artisan cheese. That was for Cynodon. Um, and 22 and 23, we got the best goat's cheese at the artisan cheese awards. Um, so yeah, I mean, awards, I think everyone says you always take them with a pinch of salt because, um, yeah it often seems like you get the awards when you don't you're not feeling like your cheese is particularly good but um anyway it's nice to it's nice to have um and um yeah some you win some you lose but, um, <laughs> no but it's good because it's a benchmarker for people who yeah 
uh, and less familiar with artisan cheeses and then they can go into a store into a deli or into a cheesemonger's and then that when they see that there's an award that maybe makes them more confident to try something different so yeah. I think you know keep entering because I think it is a you know you can become complacent and say oh well I've got all of those awards already but it does it is that um, benchmark for many many people so well done you brilliant thanks yeah um so yeah I can't remember now what's on the end oh yeah I was gonna say um so if you haven't already tasted your synodon then that might be a good moment to do it um I would say though one thing is that they um the cheese obviously is one cheese in a sense, um, but there's such a lot of variation in what a Cinnadon Hill can be. And that's really a sort of normal part of it. So if you, this was a Google image search of Cinnadon Hill um, and it's all the same cheese, but as you can see, it can be completely different. Um, sometimes you get blue mold and white mold on the rind. Um, that happens seasonally quite often. Um, some cheeses will ripen in a very, um, a kind of a, a more like a kind of gooey sort of um, ripening, like the one down in the bottom right. That's quite a sort of, I don't know, I'd almost say like a French style. Um, and there's one in the middle that's very, um, it's going to be almost like spreadable. And then some, um, a, some when they get older, um, they can you can age lactic cheeses to be much drier. Um, they can get much more peppery um, in that way. Some of them are kind of in between. And you can eat the cheese from as young as what six days old, really. And um up to there was somebody who um it's a French guy who aged one for a year and um, it was that was quite a sight. Uh, apparently Only was, the French. <laughs> <laughs> apparently the um apparently it was um you know, wasn't horrible, but I'm not sure it'd be to my taste. And it did look very a bit black, dark. I would imagine, on the rind. Yeah. Black, yeah. Um, very dark. So yeah, Neil's yard recently had been um aging bright well for three months, I think, and they're now calling it Whitnam. So again, you get a very different um cheese from those kind of those kind of things. But the kind of typical things we say about it, especially if you're eating a young one, is that the flavour will be quite yogurty um and citrusy, and that's that low pH basically that gives you those kind of flavours. Um, and then also kind of red fruit and almonds um and other nuts as well, you can taste, especially as it ages more. Um, and the texture of your eating synodin we um, often describe as being more sort of mousse-like, although again that can really vary according to the age of the cheese and how it's been um, kept. Um, and a lot of the people that we sell cheese to will be doing their own affinage, so somebody like um, Neil's Yard, Paxton, Buchanan's, um, Courtyard Dairy, they'll be doing their own affinage, so the cheeses um, might be picking up sort of certain qualities, and they might have a certain way that they like to age it. Other places you're getting the cheeses. Um, that we've just, you know, as they've come out of us and they've been wrapped and kept in the fridge, which is also perfectly fine. But yeah, it'll, it kind of goes for a different cheese. So the, because of the way that we make, we do the pre-draining, we mix in the salt, you get a kind of a lighter texture from um, Synodon and more of a kind of clotted cream, I guess you might say, texture from Brightwell Ash that drain where the curds drain under their own weight. And it's got, um, I mean, I've got a lot of people, you know, very distinctive that the paste is very white when it's goat's milk compared mm. to a cow's milk cheese where it might be very yellow or very pale, you know, pale yellow going up to very sort of um, dark yellow goat's cheese. Majority, the paste inside again is going to be very, very white, yeah, which yeah, this, okay. these are wonderful. Well done. Well, that was a really fantastic insight. I hope everybody's enjoying their Synodon who Synodon Hill who are in the um who are participating. I know we've just had one lovely lady um who's just been telling us that she's in Rebecca, she's in hospital. So I hope you get oh. better soon, Rebecca, but she hasn't got any cheese. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to that can be your like, yeah, get well soon sort of treat for when you get out of hospital. <laughs> Um, did you want to do, does anyone want to ask any questions or is that, you want to save that? I think we haven't got any questions at the moment. Um, so who are we moving on to next then? So Gary Johnston, aren't we, at um, St. Helen's Farm. Gary, are you up? Hang on, a question did come in actually. Oh, did there? Right, do you want to ask, ask it, Toby? So, uh, Aiko, 
um, has said, do you breed for temperament or mostly milk quality, as in fats, with your goats? Um, so, um, temperament actually isn't really something we've selected for. Probably should have done a bit more because we've got some quite annoying characters. Um, but no, mostly, so we're mostly looking at um milk sorry milk quality and that's actually um protein and fats and if anything the protein is more important to us than the milk but actually it's really um production qualities we're looking for as well um and as i mentioned before um the ability to milk well from um grazed grass and forage rather than having to feed them lots of grain is something which is quite genetically determined so that's something i'm trying to breed for um and for more resilience in the british climate um so things like um a goat so we're not as cheese makers ourselves we're not so interested in a goat that produces like super high yields like just like volumes and volumes of liquid milk we want the milk to have high solids we want it to be fairly steady throughout the year um we want them to be able to keep producing fairly well and we also want them to be quite we want them to be healthy so we want them to be putting energy into their own body condition um and into their own sort of immune systems rather than lots and lots of milk into um high lactations so it's a lot about trying to to choose the goats which are kind of thriving best um the ones that are healthiest i say the ones that are doing well on um high forage and pasture um and uh the less sort of sensitive um characters and like very high yielding ones they're less of interest to me so fantastic yeah. it's you uh, um so th th your answer to your question is has got fascinating thank you in the chat so it is, and it's lovely to see how expert you've become from novice to uh, goat breeder and cheese maker in just 10 years. Phenomenal. So thank you so still, much. I feel like a complete beginner still. So um, <laughs> <laughs> there's always so much more to learn, isn't there? There is, there is, yeah. I would say as well, it's like I like to have, have goats that kind of have a bit of variety in how they look. I know I'm not the only person who feels like this, so I quite like having different... <laughs> Um, yeah. There is one more question from another attendee which asks, which skills and traits do you feel serve you most as a cheesemaker? Um, I think you've got to be a problem solver um, and to sort of be able to embrace that. Um, so because the cheese has changed so much and each batch is different, I mean, I think it is a bit of a combination of sort of art and science but so Fraser my husband actually had a did a PhD in chemistry way back um and okay. I think that some of that sort of um scientific approach and like especially when we're developing the cheeses of sort of what's going right what's going wrong what's that coming from um but then yeah when things aren't going the way you want them to being able to think about what can you try to change it um or to try to keep it the same um and being like kind of patient and being um not too much of a perfectionist maybe as well because I think if you are expecting things to behave the same always then they you know you're going to be very disappointed so you can kind of embrace that journey aspect I suppose and the, embrace the problems and enjoy the kind of journey then um yeah that's and that are they takes you along. <laughs> are, are the goats someone um I can't didn't see the name sorry is asking in the chat are the goats better students now than your students before? Who's the better? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. Probably very uh, similar. <laughs> I don't think actually when I was a teacher when I was training to be a teacher, one of my students did climb out of a window when I was um yeah, doing teacher training in a um London comprehensive school so yeah that wasn't so different to a goat actually um, <laughs> <I didn't... laughs> actually we have a we, d we do have another question um from uh, a gentleman called Keith Kendrick who some of us do know um oh, so hello, Keith, Keith. Asks, <laughs> Keith asks I think there is so much to learn about the different flavor profiles from about from about a goat's cheese can you explain the range, e.g. from the citrus to the goatee, from the soft to the hard, which seems to be quite a newish style of goat's cheese? It always surprises my friends. There we go. Um, a lot of people don't like know this. about goats, hard goat's cheese. Yeah. I had a, mm. sat, and the, a lovely lady, oh, I love cheddar and I love goat's cheese. And I said, oh, well, have you tried goat's cheese cheddar? 
Mm-hmm. No, is there such a thing? Yeah. And blue, you know, you can make basically any cheese you can make with um cow's milk, you can make with goat's milk. Um, some are more traditional than others, but yeah, you can get blue, very nice blue goat's cheeses and um hard ones. So um the flavour is a lot to do with, you know, that the style of cheese and the age. But I say I think Roger might be a better person to answer that question because he makes some more a range of different styles, so he could maybe um give a more precise technical answer on that one. Yes. When we get to Roger, we'll we'll ask him that one again. But yeah, lots well, of thank you so much. So, sorry, yeah. let's give you that one for Roger. I think. Okay, so we're we're going to move. I think time wise, Toby, should we move to Gary now at Saint Helen's Farm? Yep. Thank you so That's much, right. Rachel. It's fascinating. I don't think we've ever actually met before, so it's lovely to meet you on the Zoom and hear all about your business. Wonderful. Well done. Thanks very much. Amazing. Okay, so I'm going to Gary, who was going to be Katie. Okay, Gary. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm Gary from St Helens Farm. Um, I've been work. I've been with the business for a couple of years now. Um, I've been in the cheese industry for about thirty-two years. Uh, cheese and yogurt and butter and milk. Um. Well, I've seen a few familiar faces knocking around some of the shores through uh, through the years that I've been there, but um, usually out of the goat sector, mainly in the cow, and a bit of a uh, sheep cheese manufacturer as well. Um, yeah, I've been asked to come on come on tonight just to help out and tell you a bit about us and St. Ellen's Farm. Um, we uh, the business was started by Angus and Kathleen, who have got um, a very very big passion about goats and goats milk and breeding goats um it started about 38 years ago uh in St Helens they, no it was called St Helens because there was a there was a there was a business began when it was discovered that goat well they, dis, they started the business when they discovered that goats milk was a great appeal to people who couldn't tolerate cows cows milk um there's a correlation with the lac- lactose and the size of the globules, I think, uh, that basically it makes goat's milk easy to digest. You, you guys will know more about that than myself. But um, the fire began with about 500 goats, so they started off pretty big straight away. Um, they started milking... Um, uh, sorry, the um, farm began milk about 500 goats. I soon started supplying customers such as Waitrose and Hillars, which was uh, initially a blend of sheep and goats milk yogurts. Um, the business then moved to the new site at Seaton Ross in the Vale of York, and that's where we currently are now. Um, in, the, in the early 1990s, they moved there. The extra land was needed to grow the crops to feed the goats and to expand the herds because what we do at St Helen's Farm we grow all our own feed for the goats as well so we're sort of like what do you call it um vertically integrated a lot um we began producing the cheese in about 1998 I think Angus used to have a cheddar manufacturing plant down in the southwest as well um our first third party goat milk suppliers we started to take extra milk in because the company's grown so, so much over the last 38 years i think we've, we've turned over now is around 17 15 17 million depending on market um and we also have aspects of the green side of the business you know we try to generate our own en- energy so in 2012 we brought in a first wind turbine um i think it was the first of the, the it was one of the first that was applied for in the area if, if it wasn't the first that went up that got planning, it was definitely the second. Um, and in 2013, we, the business was sold by Angus and Kathleen to Cavley, as Cavley wanted to get into the uh, good food sort of market into the UK. They had the business for about eight years, but Angus and Kathleen thought, you know, that the, the market was... It, it could do with more focus. So Angus and Kathleen bought the business back, and that obviously to try and drive the business forward. And then obviously in that, in turn, grow sales. So there's been a significant increase in the capacity and flexibility of the business recently. 
you've just been expanding and spending a lot of money on new process equipment, new buildings, new kit. I've been trying to bring in new people and teach them some of the skills that's needed to not only make cheese, but um, produce the milk and the yogurt and everything else that we sell. And the butter, the butter's a very good seller as well. Fantastic. So, if, so your main products are, oh, here we go. I see yeah. before I even need to ask. There they are yeah. on the screen. We've got a very good uh, marketing lady, Katie. She's prepared these slides for me. So, um, yeah, so we do the goat's yogurt, goat's butter. We do the semi whole and skim milk. Uh, and then we do a mild and mature cheddar. Uh, well, it's, 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 I say cheddar. It's, it's made to a sort of cheddar recipe, cheddar style, but it's um, yeah. it's more just it's more of a traditional cheese, sort, sort of between a cheddar and a red leicester sort of type. It's uh, got a bit of acid on there and a bit of sweetness, but it's higher moisture, so it it's quite unique, really. But because the milk quality is so good and clean, you don't get that sort of like go. There's not there's not a lot of off flavors in the milk. It's quite fresh and clean. A lot of people that eat cow's cheese and ch cow's cheddar or cow's traditional cheeses, they've tried ours and they're quite surprised that. It's you know it doesn't put them off. They, they have they sort of have an expectation of what they're going to taste when they have the cheese, but when they do taste it, you know they're quite surprised. It's it's quite the mouth's very mellow, very creamy, and the mature is quite nutty and roasted. You know we do have some wow. Helveticus cultures in there and everything to give it a, a roasted flavour and a, a sweetness. But um, no, it's been. And what's going your a... favourite, Gary? What what do you do you uh, eat all of these? eat and drink these products in your day-to-day yeah. -day, or is one of the cheddars your favorite no well obviously the milk that's the staple that's there all day every day the yogurt i've been known to consume one or two pots a day depending on what kind of diet i'm on <laughs> at the moment <laughs> and then big uh, pots as well oh yeah yeah well that doesn't matter it's quite moorish and then uh, i can see if you get great taste awards on these stickers on the packaging as well so that's fantastic yeah, yeah, no, we've won a few awards recently, but um, obviously we're doing a lot of the cheese as well. We have, I have to go and grade the cheese, and as you know yourself, it's that's a case of maybe getting fifty different batches out and trying bits of cheese. Um, so yeah, we do. You do get to eat a lot of cheese in the cheese industry, as you know. Um, so what was your yes. original first cheese that you used to make? Mine, it'd be Lancashire. It would be me, Lancashire. But, yeah, yeah, but um. Yeah, this is more, well, this is a bit of a cross between a traditional Lancashire and a cheddar, really, the recipe, because I started making it for St. Helens, actually, about 10 years ago, um, because the company I used to work for, we used to make the cheese for, I think it was when it was Cavley, we used to make the cheese, and basically the, the recipe has been developed, I think Graham Fry had a lot to do with that as well, coming over to Singleton's where I used to work and helping us grow that cheese and make those flavors right so right it's, it's been a development over a, a good few years but it's a good cheese now the mature is exceptionally good it's about 18 months to two years old at the minute it's um it's making my mouth water and we've got katie in the in the uh, q a asking um do it was there a cheese in the box from from you guys from st helens yes yeah 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 i think there's a mature it's... cheese in there if you want to have a nibble if anyone's got the cheese yeah, there should be a mature cheddar, a mature cheddar style cheese in there, um, Katie, if you're still uh, watching. Yeah. So um, what we've done recently, we've rebranded the cheese, uh, decided we'd give it a name because it was so good that we wanted to try and get people to start calling it by by its name rather than just cheese. So um it's a, it's a true name of our Yorkshire heritage. I actually moved from Lancashire over to Yorkshire, and I move and now live in the Wolds. Where I live, I live in the Yorkshire Wolds, really, which is it's a lovely part of the country, actually. Yeah. Don't tell my Lancashire friends, but I wish I'd moved over here about <laughs> twenty years ago. To be honest, it's uh, you can't I say that. I, don't, I do get called a traitor quite regularly, but um, <laughs> it is it is a lovely part of the world. Um, the cheese itself, it's got lots of. The mature, it's got lots of complex flavours. It's nutty and rich. That, that's because of the Helveticus as well. And the age of it at the moment, it's quite complex. So you get a, like a roastiness and then you get a strong punch. But then it mellows out to like a sweet, savoury, and then just 
lovely mouthfeel as well. It's not too brittle. It's not. It does get more crumbly the older it gets as it matures. Mature cheddar type cheeses do sort of get a little bit drier and more crumbly, but it's um, it's very versatile. The mild and the mature, you can slice it. You can do everything you can with normal territorial cheeses. Grate it, slice it, put it in sauces, pastas, pizzas, you name it. It's very good. Crumbled on salads. Um, and it's good in sandwich making as well. Uh, suitable for vegetarians because obviously we use the vegetarian rennet. Um, and yeah, and that's about it. We have where one... would you find this cheese to buy it, Gary? It, is it sold in some of the major um, supermarkets? Yeah. Waitrose, Ocado, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, and Tesco. Fantastic. Um, the mature is in Tesco and Waitrose, and the others have the mild, mild cheese. I think the mature might be in Ocado as well. But yeah, and then in the last couple of years, we've won quite a few awards for the cheese. The biggest one was probably the get the gold award for the best goat's cheese at. The best hard goat cheese, I think it was, at the International Cheese and Dairy Awards last year. Um, Fantastic. We've had a few, Bath and West, I think that was this year, yeah. We've had a silver for the uh, mature and a bronze for the mild. And then we've just had some virtual cheese awards. We did just I don't know if they published the awards, but we did uh, get a couple of results there. Um, I think we got... A first for Mature in the Artisan Cheese for Own Goat's Herd. And we got a first for the Mild in Hard Goat's Milk Cheese. Um, so, and, yeah, um, no, the cheeses went well. That's fun. That, great. That's that's a lot of awards. And again, you know, you're putting those awards and the Great Taste Awards on the packaging, which is brilliant because um, it gives the consumers... Um, who don't know the product a, a reason to try it which is wonderful um it sounds like katie didn't actually get hers in her pack so apologies katie we're not sure what went wrong there um claire lewis is asking how much of the cheese making process of this cheese is is by hand oh yeah um well the cheese making process is all traditional it's um we have uh, the normal OST, just a normal 10,000 litre vat. Uh, and then the cheese is obviously, it's running there. We've had to start a culture. It's ripened for about 45, 50 minutes. And then we have the rennet, let it set. And then it's cut and scalded and stirred in the vat. And then we drop it down into open coolers. And that's where we start to drain off the whey from the curd. And then obviously then we turn it by hand, constantly turning it because the goat's cheese itself it can get quite sticky when you're turning, so you have to keep going with it and keep working it. And then we sort of try to block it and cheddar it like a like a cheddar cheese, but we end up blocking it mainly. We get a couple of cheddar turns out of it, really, before it starts sticking together. And then we do a bit of a red lessery kind of slicing it and turning it on its side. And then we throw it through a we throw it through a chip Chipper. mill or yeah, well it's a, it's either a chip mill or a tweedy mill. Well, we call it a tweedy mill. Where it used to work in Lancashire, it's sort of like a little peg mill, but it spins around at a thousand miles an hour. But Lancashire just... never leaves the boy. Well, that's it. So it's a bit of a hybrid of quite a few different cheese, but because I've worked for West Country Farmhouse cheddar makers and Lancashire cheese makers and Wensdale cheese makers, that kind of thing. So it's a bit of a cross between a cheddar and a traditional cheese making and a Lancashire. So that's. Yeah, it's turned into a bit of a hybrid, but it's a very hybrid, nice. but it sounds like it's a, an absolutely great success. Um, Keith highly approves, saying it's absolutely delicious. Um, oh, Toby's saying we can get Katie's details if you want to leave them or email them over to us, Katie, and then we'll we'll get you some Saint Helens. Um, we can get some cheese sent out to you as extra. Um, and we're it also, also getting it also. Asked, Sorry, Tracy, I was just going to respond to something on, on the Q&As. Um, if you've got the St. Helens mature cheese in the packs that you ordered for the tasting, you may have um, the uh, a cheese that doesn't have the new cheese name on it because it just it just crossed over at the point when the new yeah. packaging came out, um, just so that you know. Fantastic. So that's that is it is the it is the um, the mature goat's cheese. So another 
question from Katrina. What age do you generally package the mature cheese for wholesale? Um, it's um, well, it's changed over the last few years, but we're we're looking at about twelve to eighteen months old usually for the mature, on average at the moment. Yeah, um, we are selling a lot more, so obviously, as you guys all know, with cheese making, getting that balance right of laying stocks down and maturing, it's a it's a fine art at times, but it's um down to age profile and flavour profile really you're looking for the body and the characteristics of the cheese but you're also looking for that flavour profile and that note or that sweetness or that roasted flavour so it's there's quite a few different things but I'd say on average 12 to 18 months at the moment that's fantastic brilliant any other questions uh, for Gary otherwise I think we'll move on time is racing away with us um Thank you. It was really interesting to hear all about it and hear another perspective of quite a, you know, as a bigger producer and processing lots of goat's milk as well. Um, oh, here's one. Uh, Kerry Cryer is saying, love, love, love this cheese. I can hear Kerry saying that now. Hi, <laughs> Kerry. Um, how big is each cheese? Um. Well, the, the retail size is 175 gram, but the actual cheeses that we produce in block form, the 20 kilo. I was going to say 20 kilos, pounds, yeah. So yeah. made like a, a the, the old school sort of block cheddar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they're all uh, boxed by hand, put in the press by hand, taken out the press by hand, vacuum packed, and then put into crates and stored until they're ready for mature. And that's when I go over... To Lancashire once once a month and start grading cheeses. Um, I think we sell about a, roughly between 120 and 150 tons a year at the moment. It's um, fantastic. Well, well done you, and it just proves the popularity of goat's milk now, doesn't it, mm, within these yeah. products, which is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Gary, for joining us. I'm going no to de-spotlight you. you now. And we are going to go to, are we to you, Toby, next? Uh, no, I think we should go to Roger. Okay. Mr. Mr. Longman. Okay, okay. Roger, Roger, you are going to be up. Hang on. Um, add spotlight and I'll remove Gary. And then, hi, Roger. Hello, so my camera looks a bit so blurry. long, so long that since I saw you on the Zoom. I know. Tell us all about your wonderful <laughs> cheeses at White Lake. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of goat's cheeses. Long time ago. So yeah, it's interesting listening to, to to Rachel's story about how she started. So we, I'm slightly different in that I'm a third generation farmer. Um, my parents and grandparents were, were cheddar and kafili makers. Uh, I didn't want to be a farmer. It looked like hard work. I did engineering, built tractors for five years, loved it, uh, but found I'm not very good at not being the boss. So I came back to the family farm just at the point when cheddar making was, you know, artisan cheese make, cheddar makers were struggling um, and decided that, oh, goats look quite simple. They're like small cows. Um, unfortunately, they're not like small cows, as Mr. Clarkson will have found out. Uh, they're quite tricky animals, but they are great fun. So we started milking goats in 2001. Um, we managed to source about 50 goats or kids in 2000 and then foot and mouth hit in 2001. So we were unable to source goats for a couple of years, but we've now built up to milking about 700 goats. Um, and we've changed our breeding to French Alpines, which are lovely brown goats with a, a black stripe down their back. I wasn't organized enough to, to bring photos, um, but they're all sorts of colors as well because they're mixed they're not pure breads. So like um, like Rachel's, we have a, a mix of genetics, which gives us a very interesting um, animal. But what it does mean for us particularly is we get a very high fat milk. Um, so our creasy, cheeses are always super creamy. Um, and that's that's sort of one of our, our key points, really. I think someone asked earlier about what sort of cheese can you make from goat's milk? You can make pretty much everything. Um, mozzarella is quite tricky. You need a very high fat milk to make goat's mozzarella. Um, I have tried it several times. I've succeeded once and I've not been able to succeed again. Um, so I will keep trying and, and work out what I've done wrong. But yeah, that's 
there's no reason you can't make anything um, from goat's milk that you can make from cow's milk or, or, or buffalo's milk uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, and that to me is one of the, the joys of, of being a, a cheesemaker is you take milk, a beautiful natural basic product, and you can turn it into some quite amazing products from blue to mozzarella to brie to lactic cheeses like Synod Hill or Ardriftwood. Um, so it's it's a great industry to be in. Um, and obviously, Tracy, we're involved in the, the Affineur of the Year competition, which I thoroughly recommend, recommend to everyone who's listening. So I think there are still tickets available in London for, I want to say, the 12th of June to come along and taste a whole load of cheeses. So check out the Academy um, website for that. And that'll be a good, lots of free cheese to eat once you've got in there. Um, oh, for sure. Meet some of the cheese makers and and some of the affineurs as well. So it's it's a good it's a good day out, and um, we are aging someone else's cheese, and some lots of people are aging some of our cheeses. Um, and we shall. And you're going to bring work. along some of your goat's cheeses. To I am going to I am going to bring long. along some new goat's cheeses because I'm always making new cheeses. So uh, we had Melton Mowbray our son cheese awards last weekend, uh, and we took some new cheeses up there that sold out on day one. Um, so we're rapidly making some more to, to bring up for um, the Affineur of the Year competition because it's a great way of getting cheese fans to to have the sort of first taste as a reward for, for coming to his event. So I thoroughly and giving you lot give you lots of uh, feedback as well, lots of customer feedback. They do, and, 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 and that's that's really important. And I think you know Rachel talked about the first time she made cheese. You make a cheese, you think, oh, this is the best cheese ever. Um, but until customers actually come back and buy it a second or third time, you're never quite sure. So it's and winning awards is is you know I am very competitive. I do like to win. Uh, my biggest problem now is um, Rachel's got so good at making goat cheese, she tends to beat me in the goat cheese categories. Um, so I'm going to have to come up with another another cunning plan um, and develop some new cheeses to to win those trophies back. So. But well, maybe it's, it's good, and, and ultimately the, the consumer is the beneficiary because, you know, I'm <laughs> definitely having to up my game, uh, and, and that's one thing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I can't stop. I, you know, I can't help myself. It's, it's, it's you know, my, my brain can't just do one thing at a time. It has to do lots of different things at the same time, so that's how. Well, you've got, you've got a very, good. very big fan here. Um, Keith is saying, Roger, you're Rachel Reserver. Which is one of it's it's not a it's not a cheddar style it's a hard goat's cheese, um is not just one of the greatest goat's cheese but one of the greatest cheeses per se. I'll say that. How I'll much take, did you I'll pay take, him to that, say yeah. that? Well, I, I don't even know who this Keith Kendrick is. So, thank you, Keith. <laughs> um, yeah. So in in your box today, you should have um, some um, Eve, hopefully. Oh wow! The little one, oh, here. The one big, I one I prepared baby. earlier, and that's quite clever actually because it's mirrored. It reads Eve, Eve, whichever way you look at it. So, um, yeah. So that's this is a little um goat delicate goat brie style cheese um that we wash in in cider brandy, uh, just one single wash to, and that makes the rind very thin, uh, and then we wrap it in a vine leaf. So as it ripens, the vine leaf holds it together. Otherwise, it will just burst out with, with such a thin rind. And it's um, you get a lovely crunch from the vine leaf when you when you cut into the cheese. So I'm just going to show you how the best way to eat this cheese. So I'm just going to cut into it. And as you can see, uh, hopefully you can see, it's a sort of softish paste, so you can squish it. This one is not, this is not super ripe yet. This is about four weeks old. Um, if you can resist eating it for another couple of weeks, it will will go very runny on the inside and develop a tremendous sweetness. But I will just show you the correct way of, of eating this. No! Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't for. agree <laughs> with eating cheese like apples because then you can't talk to me. So I will just say... I know, I I've, I've quickly that swallowed that, honest. Uh, you know, people get very upset about how you should eat your cheese and i'm very much a believer it's entirely up to you how you eat cheese you can nibble at it you can take a big chunk you can you can do whatever you like i think the the old days of um you know people getting upset that you cut the nose off a of brie um a long gone and uh yeah so always enjoy cheese coming back to a couple of things that um 
that Gary from uh, St. Helens was talking about was the the health aspects of of of, of goat cheese. So we make know, all the producers here make very tasty goat cheeses, uh, and we're very artisan. Uh, everything we do is is done by hand, apart from the dishwasher. Uh, that is an automatic dishwasher which we load and unload. But I, I kind of feel washing by hand. Washing by hand is you know the days of that are, are long gone. Uh, I think someone was asking earlier about how you make cheese. The most important thing you need is a dishwasher. Um, yeah. So, and it's it's hygienic, isn't it? Everybody it's very hygienic. And, 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 and we, we, we're not a... Cheese making is not about a sterile environment um, because we are growing bacteria, moulds and yeasts. Um, it's about providing the right environment for the moulds and yeasts that we want to grow to, to win the battle. Um, and some of our cheeses, like again, like Synod Hill, will get occasional blue spots on them. Um, you know, and that's absolutely fine. That's just natural mold that's blowing around, perfectly healthy. Uh, and you know, you get a slightly different flavor with it. Um, you know, when is it, people ask, well, is that cheese out of date? To have a taste. If it if it tastes good, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as it doesn't have red mold, red mold's bad, but pretty much any other sort of mold is, is is generally pretty good. But the the thing that people keep forgetting with with, with goat's cheese is, is the health benefits um from from goat's goat's cheese and goat's milk particularly we get a lot of children um will switch to goat's milk because they've got eczema problems um and so that's that's really important for, for people to understand and unlike in plant milks you get natural vitamins and minerals already in in the product so that's uh, so you're getting the great taste of the, the cheese or the milk or the butter but with a lot more health benefits so you know i think it's it's really important that so we've got um we've got a couple of things i'll just say claire lewis has said can i just give a big shout out to roger and all the people who man the stalls at the food festivals and farmers markets and act as gatekeepers in enticing the general public into trying these great cheeses i agree claire well said Thank and we've got a slightly more Serious question for Roger. People yeah. are increasingly concerned about climate change. Yeah. How does goat's cheese fit into the sustainability narrative? Yeah, so we we look at our sort of carbon footprint um, from a farm aspect and from a, a cheese processing aspect. Um, the, the farm aspect, we have solar panels on our roofs and in some of our bits of fields. So most of our electricity we use on the farm is, is generated from solar. Certainly for at least six months of the year. Uh, in the winter, we just don't get enough sunlight, so we're having to buy, but you probably find it, if we look at it from the whole year, we pump electricity back into the grid, so it evens out. Unfortunately, we pump it back at 3p a unit and we buy it back at 21p a unit, so it's not quite fair. Um, but that's that, and, and the cheese room, we, all our heat that we use is, is generated from wood that's sourced from local woodlands. Uh, we've also planted 10 acres of, of, of woodland ourselves, a lot of eucalyptus, which grows incredibly quickly. So it's it's soaking up carbon much faster. Unfortunately, I will never get to see those tr trees matured and, and used again. But that's kind of my way of, of carbon offsetting is planting more trees. And we will continue to plant um, trees every year um, to, to offset the, the, the wood we are we are burning to generate our heat. And I think that's as... That's quite a simple way of doing it for me. And because the trees are on my land, I am maintaining them and replacing ones that die and things like that, rather than just paying someone to plant trees in, in, in Kenya that never actually grow. Um, I think that the biggest part of climate change for us is the, the, the sort of the methane that comes out of a goat. Um, and people always think it's, it's goats farting. It's not it's actually goats burping. Um, and there's a lot of research these days on, you know, how you, what you feed the goat or the cow um, to reduce that. So we, we, I follow a lot of research and we just wait to see where that research leads us. But I think, you know, we feed our goats a, a pelleted cake and hay. Most of our hay comes from the Somerset levels. Um, so it's got all sorts of amazing plants in it, which the goats absolutely love. Um, and that's on land you can't really do a lot else with. Um, you can't grow soya on it. You can't grow wheat on it. You definitely can't grow oats on it. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good use of, of that land. And I'm a big fan of particularly cow's milk being grazed grass uh, and those sorts of things. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, OK, so I think, Roger, that's been amazing. Other than you eating Eve like an apple. But I'm sure Adam will be very pleased. Yeah. <laughs> See my little joke there? Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, who are we moving to next, ch chaps? To to you, Toby, or to Gary? Yeah, to no, I'll go. But thank you very I'll... much, Roger, and keep up the good work. Um, great, great cheeses, you know, with total respect. Thank you. See Thanks you in me. June. <laughs> thank you. Right, Toby, you're going to talk to us. Let me. Can you see oh, that he's image? Going to show me the screen. Brilliant. Have you got? Have you, can you see that image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on. Yeah, yeah. We're on. So I am here to um, talk to you about Delamere Dairy, who are one of the members of the Milk and Goat Association, <laughs> um, and they are based up in Knutsford in Cheshire. And as a dairy, they began. Uh, farming with goats in 1985 initially in the Delamere forest in Cheshire um, and they started with three goats but today it's a much much um, bigger dairy and company and it sells a massive range of goats milk products rather like St Helens they do milk they do cheese they do yogurt and they do do butter um, the thing that is on the screen that you can see is the Greek goat's cheese that they make entirely from their goat's milk. Um, obviously, for those cheese aficionados on the call, you'll know that feta is traditionally made with sheep and goat's milk. Um, but this Delamere Greek goat's cheese is a feta style cheese made purely with um, goat's milk. It's a hundred percent pasteurized goat's milk um, and they suggest in terms of its use obviously in salads it's great as a cooking ingredient uh, we're using it with pastry um, works beautifully with anchovies and lamb and tomatoes and basil and black olive so all those wonderful flavors you get from traditional European and, and Greek cuisine work really really well with this um, when you're coming to eat it, I hope for those of you who um, ordered the pack for the tasting of the talk tonight have got um, a, a pack of this feta in it, or this sort of feta style cheese in it, and you've let it warm up a little bit. You should always let your cheese warm up um, before you eat it. Um, but once you have let it warmed up a little bit and you get to taste it, if you're tasting it now or later, you get a beautiful, delicious, rich, tangy flavour um, with um, a very creamy texture. Um, I actually really, I don't actually have any on me today, but I have had this cheese a number of times and it is absolutely wonderful on its own in salads or even as a cooking ingredient. Um, and it's just lovely to have such a delicious cheese made here from UK goat's milk made by a UK company. Um, if you've never tried any Delamere products, I suggest you do. They are available in most supermarkets and um, fine food shops um, in terms of um, the range of product they do. And then the other great thing about the company is they have a really interesting website. Um, and if you want any recipe suggestions, they have a lovely recipe section there. And you'll find out more about the company if you actually look at the website. Um, just Google Delamere Dairy and it'll come straight up. But um I hope you enjoy the cheese you've got at your pack. If you ordered a pack this evening, if you haven't, I suggest you try some because it's absolutely delicious. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tracy, you've disappeared. Mute. Oh, I'm you're here, mute. I'm here, I'm here. Okay, um, so Keith, Keith has just said he's tried it. It's not as salty as feather, but it's great texture. Um, and he sees that Delaware butter mm -hmm. has won two great taste stars. Yes, it has indeed. It's a really good butter. Actually, I enjoy using it in my cooking. Fantastic. Thank you, Toby, for giving us that insight. It's a very popular brand. You do, like you say, see it in the supermarkets and and great, great use of um, goat's milk, British goat's milk. So shall we shoot over? Because there's a few people having to leave the webinar now. So shall we shoot over to Gary? Um to tell us all about um goats 
milk farming, goat farming. Is that right? Yes. And well, Abergavenny. Ab yes. So I love Abergavenny goat's cheese. It is the best. Absolutely you've, beautiful. You've got some of the Abergavenny goat's cheese in your pack. So Abergavenny, it's uh, just five miles away. I'm not quite as close as uh, Rachel, four metres away from her dairy, but it's pretty close. So I used to deliver the milk with a tractor and trailer. So like I said earlier, I've been supplying them for 22 years. So they're the largest manufacturer of soft goat's cheese in the UK. So if we go on to the next slide. So uh, the backstory of Abergavenny Fine Foods is that um, Pam and Tony Krask, uh, Pam sent Tony to the Abergavenny market to buy a cow and he came back with six goats instead. So she was slightly horrified and they ended up with so much milk they didn't know what to do. So she, she got a book out of the library on making cheese and um, that's where it all started, making the same soft goat's cheese that they make now. So that was way back in 1981. So... Uh, they started buying milk off some small small holders in the local area that used to carry it in, in buckets. And then um, I was sort of, sort of first larger commercial farmer to start supplying them back in 2002. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, please. So that's the original brand, the Pantis mm. Guown, which um, our farm is actually called Pant Farm, but so is the Krask's farm was called Pantis Guown Farm which is on the slide side of the Blorange Mountain, just outside Abergavenny. So they made it in the farmhouse kitchen for a number of years, and then they moved to a creamery site in Abergavenny. Uh, they've now got a larger site in Blenavon where they process other foods, but the Abergavenny is still the creamery site where the milk is processed. And in the picture on the left, you can see me and my wife with some goats, and then Tony and Pam that started the business above them. And then Ed, Dan and Beefy um, with the, the new dairy, which was put in in 2015. Um, a bit like Rachel said, it was uh, it's put into the sort of muslin pillowcases, for want of a better word, where they drain the whey off. And it's it's a relatively young cheese. If we move on to the next next slide. It's, Is it it's completely, um, and sadly I'm that old that I used to sell the Pansy Gowan in brand in my shop in my cheese shop in Ludlow and it was fantastic um is it completely lactic cheese or is do you add some some there's they just add a bit of salt to it it's almost like a okay. curd really and they have actually started marketing a curd product um more to uh to the sort of food service sector to restaurants and whatnot yeah. so that you don't see the pantis ground name quite as much so when it was sold to people like yourself it was marketed as pantis ground but now most of it is sold to the supermarkets and supermarkets like to think, label things with their own label wherever they can so quite often sainsbury's actually call it abergavenny soft goat's cheese tesco mm. it's welsh welsh goat's cheese morrison's it's welsh goat's cheese i think in um, more in waitrose it's british goat's cheese it's in all the, the major retailers it's not in Aldi and Lidl yet, but um, watch this space. So um, if we just move on to the next slide, please. So they, it's classically in this log. So if you see the log and it says British soft goat's cheese, it's generally um, come from Abergavenny. So I'm not sure if you've just, the, the plain one is, is quite, uh, it's sort of quite lemony and um, very smooth and very mild. It, it's probably, an entry level cheese where you can't really taste any of that um, goatiness. It, it's it's particularly mild. The French um, the French wouldn't like it at all, I don't think. Uh, and it's almost spreadable. And they do a garlic and herb, which is in the top left. And then my favourite is the honey and ginger at the bottom. Um, wow. And they also they do a cranberry one around Christmas time. So look out for that. I've but, not seen the honey and ginger. Where would you buy that? Um, generally, oh, who had that? It was in Aldi's, but then they they stopped it. I'm not sure. You'd have to check out the different supermarkets. I I feel a bit of a fraud because I'm not an expert cheese maker by any stretch. I can talk about goats all day long, but um, exactly, you're an expert goat farmer, so even better. Yeah. I've yeah. got quite a good question from Keith here. 
um, which is maybe one. Where is that that question gone? It was in the chat, wasn't it? It's maybe one for um, for Toby rather than for yourself, but you might have a view on it. Um, Keith is actually the uh, uh, editor of BBC Good Food magazine, um, and he's a curious bugger. He says a lawyer, but he's a curious bugger. We love you yeah. lots, Keith. It's all goat and shit. He's just come back from San Sebastian. Lucky you. It's all goat and sheep's cheese over there. There isn't an image problem. Do you think there is a challenge around image in the UK? And if so, why? Or is it just a case that it is a small player in the cheese market? Um, is that one for me? Is that one for me? I Well, I think for anybody, really. I'll, I'll give it a go. So I'm, I'm not sure we've got an image problem. I think we are quite niche still. Um, and cows, um, we had our AGM today and the lady that was presenting there was talking about... Um, uh, different products and we had slides showing how big the cow's cheese and cow's milk sector is in the UK and we are a little tiny sector in the goat's market so we are just a, a small niche player I don't think I wouldn't say we necessarily have an image problem I don't know if Toby or anyone else wants to comment on that Rachel you had your hand hand up did you want to say something yeah um I think it's a bit of a historical thing that um and there are sort of some people who still have a bit of a um, I remember when we went to first used to go to farmers market some people would like come over to you just to tell you they didn't like goat's cheese and it's a bit like well fine <laughs> don't have to. but in the way that people don't with cow's milk I think um, but I do think that's changing quite a lot there was an article in the times this week about um, the changing trends and how um, British consumers are buying a lot more um, more, more variety of cheese now and not just your kind of classic standard cheddar um, and wet beer you know even the supermarkets things like halloumi mozzarella are getting much more popular and people, I think, you know, I find now if you go into a restaurant, like nine times out of 10, the vegetarian option will be um, a goat's cheese something, you know, that will mm. be. Um, and uh, I find most people now will be saying, oh, I love it. I really like it. Um, and I think there's a lot more. I actually think there's a lot more better goat's cheese out as well. I think maybe some of the stuff in the early days just wasn't that nice. Um, you know, it wasn't being made brilliantly, but I think the cheese yeah. sector in this country has just improved massively in the last few decades, particularly um and so when people do try it they have a much better experience so and uh, i think um in in spain and uh, the hotter countries that's the only animal that thrives really well are the sheep and the goats so they don't have much cow's milk so it's that kind of alter thing you know our our yeah. cow's milk production i think it's been... a her i think it's a heritage thing here in the uk yeah. uh, you know the cow's milk took over in a way whereas goat's milk a lot of people don't know this but goat's milk is the biggest animal milk drunk throughout the whole of the world mm. um it's far more popular globally than cow's milk is for drinking on a regular basis and well, i think here in the uk more, sorry to talk over to you we, we historically we used to have a lot more goats in this country and it was yeah. a lot of historical reasons like the enclosures act when people um yeah had, it was a bit quite a common sort of cottage animal that people would have. It gives a bit, you know, it's an easy to keep size. They literally like weeds and scraps. They're, um, you know, you get a nice bit of meat from them. Plus it's a really manageable amount of milk for a family. Um, and then like with the enclosures and with um, like the wool prices in the sort of 17th, 18th century and Highland clearances as well. That's when the population mm. of goats really dropped. But actually historically this country did have goats as well. But yeah. Sort of no, I think, I think that you're absolutely right. And that's yeah. something that I saw when I was doing some research about it recently. But I think Keith also says that I find people have a prejudice, especially around goat and blue. And I, I think here in the UK, that, that that is true. And I think it's challenging people's perceptions and getting them to try it. Roger, Roger has a wonderful um, set of words, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's based on goat. It's go out and try. You know, it's it's... It, and and you know I <laughs> I've I've worked in cheese for you know, yeah. a lot of years and friends and you know family expect cheese boards when they come for dinner at mine and I will always put a goat's cheese on and a lot of them still say oh I'm not too sure and it's just getting them to try it and often it's because they've had an experience where they've had something they didn't like the taste of but there is a huge variety of flavors in goat's cheese that's produced here in the UK now and you just need to go and try them I think. I know, and um, 
Terry Cryer is saying you guys must love how G O A T stands for greatest of all time. <laughs> Absolutely. And, I mean, you're having a wonderful goat's milk appreciation week, aren't you? You've had loads of shout outs over um, social media from people who sell goat's milk cheeses. And um, this is quite is this this is quite a new week in the sort of celebration. Yeah, this is. Calendar. I mean, this is a. Yeah, we we set this up for the Milk and Goat Association for the first time this year, purely just as a, you know, uh, to to see what would happen and to promote goats goats milk products in the UK and goats milk. You know, we had a fantastic shout out last Friday from Nigel Barden on BBC Radio London to help sort of. Uh, support that started it and we've had some really lovely social media posts from cheesemongers and people who love cheese um, and if you look at um, Love Goats Milk, the Instagram account you can see all of that <laughs> and please follow us because we, we would love more more people to follow us but yeah it's 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 been really good and I, I think it's just an opportunity to promote these wonderful cheesemakers we here, have here and all the companies yeah and people involved in the goat's milk industry in the UK. Yeah, and it, just wonderful. And it's really w lovely to hear your stories and hear the perspective from the farmer and cheesemaker and to the bigger producers, to the smaller producers. So I hope um, everybody's enjoyed tonight's webinar. Um, we're really delighted to host different webinars like this for you guys. Um, and it's been great to have so many people join us and participate and ask so many interesting questions so thank you to you the audience um i think we've uh haven't got any more questions so if the, unless there's anything anybody else would like to say i'm gonna say over and out for tonight gary did you want to say a quick little roundup no uh just say it's been a really good evening and uh, I would just wish I had the cheese box here so I could have tasted it. I'm getting really hungry listening to CNL. All these I know, I mean, my mouth is watering. It's watering. I can't yeah. remember who said, but someone's just said in the chat that they can't choose which one is their favourite. So all credit to you guys. Um, I know a lot of you have to get up very early tomorrow to do more milking and more cheese making. So thank you to everybody for joining. Um, do check out Academy of Cheese website and our cheese library has hundreds of goat's cheeses in there. So um, excellent news for all and have a good rest of um, Goat's Milk Appreciation Week. <laughs> Yay! Bye everyone. Thank you.